Good evening, everyone. I'm Jeff Simon, and welcome to Social Flight Live. We have a great show for you this evening. Dan Schwinn is here, founder and CEO of Avidine. Um, let, until we get started here, let's tell you a little bit about what's been going on. As we've been doing every single week, uh, our Takeoffs for Takeout program, uh, I'd like to share with you here. We made our, our latest trip to Block Island, Rhode Island, and uh, we did that with uh, um, uh, three out of the four kids that we had here to go. It was a lot of fun. We um, uh, went down there uh, with, as you can see, Lily here is uh, getting her chance to fly. Ben's in the back there with uh, Joe. Had a great flight down. Um, you can see here, and here's a little quiz as we're going into Block Island. See, uh, you can use the, uh, uh, the uh, section here for sending in questions and see if you can name what kind of aircraft that is on the ground that they use there at the local um, uh, at the local flight service at Block Island. Kind of a cool plane. We went and checked that out while we were there on the ground. Um, and then a few other pictures just to show you. If you have any opportunity to go visit Block Island, it's a great, great stop. Here in New England, we have such a great um, uh, uh, you know, setup for general aviation because the geography is set up in such a way that you have the islands, things that normally take a ferry to get to, or the mountains up in New Hampshire that uh, may be more difficult by car, and all of it is so much easier to reach by general aviation. So we were able to land here at Block Island. It's about a mile and a half walk into town. Um, uh, it's a great walk and a great uh, a number of sites that you can see here. Uh, uh, ice cream, food, all sorts of other cool things. And we're rewarded on our way out as well um, with a really wonderful uh, sunset uh, and great weather all around. So it was a fun trip. And as always, our mission is to support general aviation during this time by uh, supporting the local FBOs and restaurants and businesses. And I would encourage all of you to do the same at any opportunity that you have. Now, I will say also, I was hoping to be able to introduce a new private pilot uh, this uh, evening, but uh, we have another delay. And so my son Jake now is on, I believe, his fourth uh, cancellation due to either aircraft weather or uh, an issue with uh, the examiner. Oh, we're so close. So maybe next week we will be able to introduce a new private pilot to you. With that, I would like to go and introduce our featured guest of the evening, Dan Schwinn, founder and CEO of Avidyne. Dan has been a pilot since 1987. He founded Avidyne in 1995 and has been running it now for 25 years as an established provider of easy-to-use avionics for general aviation. And as someone who uses Avidyne equipment, I've got to say that is very much uh, the, uh, the truth. They have hit the mark in that regard. I'm a huge fan of their uh, avionics. Um, I'm going to bring Dan online now. Over the years, Dan has flown a couple of Moonies for hundreds of hours, a Lake Amphibian, variety of Cirrus and Cessnas, and even some jet time. And his current everyday aircraft is, a, as I understand, a Cessna 206. And uh, Dan, do I understand that you just got a tailwheel endorsement? That's right, Jeff. Uh, thanks for inviting me on your program. And uh, that was I, I got that done right before the COVID craziness set in, in December and January. Um, and uh, needless to say, there's been some distractions in the meantime of doing anything with it, but uh, I, I definitely intend to. I had a great time doing it. That is, that's so cool. And before we really get into it, I also want to finish your bio because there's so much to it. I mean, obviously, you, uh, I, I'll say you, you are one of the icons of the general aviation industry right now in the past 25 years and what you've done to, to bring uh, uh, such a big competitor to the marketplace and provide pilots uh, with these avionics. Uh, you're a graduate of MIT, a member of the visiting committee on aeronautics and astronautics at MIT and a director uh, at EAA as well, which we'll talk about, and Gamma, is that correct? Yeah, that's all just fun stuff that I get to do on the side. Excellent, so take us back a little bit, help, I mean, you know, the I've obviously been in the avionics industry now for over 25 years as well, and you know, it, it's a that's a tough business, so help, help us understand what put, what pushed you into this market and what was it like getting started? So I was, uh, I got my private pilot's license in 87. I was doing a tech startup 
you know, I'm an electrical engineer by background, so I'm comfortable with the technology. And I was flying around in my Mooney with uh, 1980s and 90s generation avionics, mechanical instruments, and I think I had an area navigator like a, like a, a North Star Loran. And I did, you know, I did a private pilot's license and then an instrument mating immediately thereafter, and it was pretty difficult. Um, so, you know, my reaction over time as I started flying around a bunch and trying to use, you know, do some business stuff and other travel in my Mooney was that, you know, this could be an awful lot easier. And I was familiar enough with the technology in terms of what was possible. But I went around to the established players and as particularly Honeywell and Collins because they were the guys who started to have electronic flight decks at that time mm -hmm. and said, you know, that wonderful new Collins flight deck, uh, you know, that with all the displays and gadgets and so forth, you know, when are you going to make that for my Mooney? And the guys would just shake their heads and say, you know, geez, I don't know. I don't even know if that's possible. You don't have the useful load for all those. <laughs> you can't carry it. And do you know one of these ship sets cost more than like twice as much as that you paid for that Mooney? And, you know, it was kind of like this isn't coming to a, uh, you know, to to an airplane near you anytime soon. So as my first company, as my participation, my first company started to wind down. I, at that time, we had the NASA Agate program going on that was trying to do some innovation. And there were a lot of new airframe startups coming along. And so I thought that I would uh, give it a whirl in avionics. I, I would say that uh, the most surprising thing to me was that the regulatory environment has a much, much larger effect than I thought it would as a tech entrepreneur coming into, I mean, I was a general aviation pilot, so I was subject to you know, I had to get licenses as a pilot and keep my airplane airworthy and all that kind of stuff. And I thought I knew, you know, how this regulatory stuff was going to play out as a manufacturer. My prior company was telecom. We had to get regulatory approval for our stuff. So I say, yeah, I know how this works, but I had no idea. Um, the, the regulatory environment has a big, big effect on, on how companies act. And mm -hmm. I didn't really understand that. So that, that took a lot of learning, and, and as we went through and certified more and more safety-critical products, I realized that, that that is a major driver of what people get to see and how many competitors they have to choose from and how, how long it takes technology to come into the market, things like that. Right. So that was, uh, that, was, that was probably the most surprising thing to me as I you know, started to get into it in Avidine. Interesting. I mean... That does seem to be, obviously, regulatory side of things from the FAA seems to be the biggest driver, and a lot of people don't make it through that process. I, I've witnessed it in my own career. So many companies come in with wonderful ideas, great uh, you know, demos of new product and what they could do, but uh, usually un completely underestimating what it really takes to get through that system and many of them either don't have the means or the, uh, uh, to do it or, or the stomach to make it through the entire process and make it to market. And I think that's obviously one of the biggest differences between everybody else and what you've accomplished at Avidyne. Well, I think one of the things that, that was beneficial for us is when we started 25 years ago, um, you know, the TSO system had been used for a bunch of mechanical things, but not so much for electronics. And you didn't have 400 page mops telling you how to make a display. And that that happened over the last 25 years. And it would be a whole lot harder to start up an Avidine nowadays than it was for us. So we, we had these increasing regulatory overhead occur while we were already in existence and we kind of adapted to it. But if you were starting from scratch and wanted to build a product like what we build today, it would be a very, very big regulatory hurdle. That's so interesting. It's interesting to think of it that way because I think it's it's easy to look at the more recent changes that have happened with even allowing non-certified avionics to some degree into the cockpit and think that things have gotten easier over the past 25 years. But 
uh, in reality, not not so much, at least not when we're talking about navigational equipment, critical navigational equipment like what you produce. Well, if you look at what happened with the so-called non-certified stuff getting certified, it's really uh, a parallel process has been put in place by the FAA, this so-called ASTM STC process. Um, that has been the, you know, I, I think that's kind of been an industry and even FAA reaction to the fact that they realized that the regulations were stymieing innovation, which was having a negative effect on safety. Mm -hmm. So right now, you as a GA manufacturer, you have sort of these two parallel worlds of, of certification. You've got the traditional TSO STC uh, you know, process, which has developed over, say, the last 30 to 40 years. And then you've got this ASTM STC process, which has developed over about the last five years and is much more streamlined, but it limits your access to certain airplanes and also to geographic areas and mm -hmm. OEMs in some cases are not necessarily comfortable with that and so forth. So it's it's an interesting situation and a state of evolution. We've done a couple of ASTM products. I think one of the things that's happened is that when the established guys do a ASTM product, we use a lot of our normal process. Mm -hmm. But where a purely experimental guy does it, they they don't use as much. So it's it's quite it has a lot of flexibility in terms of how it works. Right. Well, um, let me. I mean, let's clarify for everyone too, because I think there's a very very big distinction between things like uh, displays only that are going in front of the pilot, or something that's that's really just showing you stuff from certified navigation versus creating a core navigator and that to me is the big distinction between those two markets in terms of what you can do at this point at least in, unless I hear something different is happening at the FAA and so if you look at uh, you know displays if you look at all the different avionics that you can get out there for either experimental or for certified aircraft at the at their core if you want to fly IFR for example you still need that IFR certified navigator and uh, aside from, you know, maybe things that are going into the jets as FMSs, uh, you, there's, there's what, two options for that, two companies? I mean, and, and we, we'd have one if it weren't for what you've done at Avidyne. And that's that whole concept of getting deep into what to take for certified navigation, both radio and GPS, an FMS, a flight management system, everything that goes along with with understanding and being able to navigate approaches and en route, et cetera. Um, take us through the the evolution of your products at Avidyne from the beginning in a way and, and how you made that leap, because that to me seems like the biggest distinction in the marketplace for Avidyne. Well, the evolution um, was kind of driven by the market. When you start off with a, a new company um, in, general aviation or a lot of markets, um, you know, the aftermarket is is where you're going to be able to get some business right away because you have to, you can do, you can sell one person a product and if they have confidence it's a decent product, they'll buy it and put it in and fly away and you had a sale and, and you've got a, hopefully a, a happy customer out there. Whereas, um, and we, that's how we started off. We started off with aftermarket products. You know, I think it was probably in 97 or something. I had a, had a 10 by 10 booth at Oshkosh and those old hangers that are not there anymore. And, uh, you know, me and my girlfriend at the time stood there for eight hours a day without leaving and talked to lots of people who had never seen a bright color moving map before. And, you know, some of those people turned into our early customers. Um, but the, the OEMs tend to be more, have a, have a more, sort of a traditional approach to selecting vendors. And at that time, the situation was there were a handful of established aircraft manufacturers, and there was really one, but maybe a couple of established avionics manufacturers, that one being Bendix King. And the established aircraft manufacturers weren't all that interested in talking to a, a new entry avionics manufacturer. And then these new guys came along, uh, Lance Aaron, Cirrus, and Adam, and 
Javelin and Eclipse and all these other guys. And the established avionics manufacturers weren't that interested in putting a lot of effort into these new aircraft manufacturers because they thought, didn't know who was going to succeed or whatever. So as we were growing as a business, our option, if we wanted to be in the aircraft, you know, making products for aircraft manufacturers was really to talk to the new guys. And their option was really to talk to the new guys. And so that's how we ended up transitioning over and in that period in the early 2000 era when there were, I mean, I don't know how many, but a couple of dozen at least of, um, of you know, aircraft startups. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we didn't know whether Lance Air or Cirrus or either one of them was going to be successful or any of these other guys. So we just right. kind of, whoever we could do business with, we did. And then that, that swung us towards the OEM side for a decade. Um, and, and then as that paired, as many of those companies didn't end up staying around, we ended up focusing back on the aftermarket side. And, but, but I think that the fact that we, for a period there, had the majority of our business coming from aircraft manufacturers, and at the time, there wasn't this alternative certification approach. So as we were building the business through that period, culturally, we became a company that used the traditional TSO, SCC, TC process to design our products. And, yep. you know, there was a, there was a, you know, if you wanted to build a GPS navigator, there was a pretty steep price of entry. But when we looked at it, it was, that was the only option. And so, um, so that's, we, we went after it and managed to get it done. So did the, the, the flight decks, the Integra flight decks that, that drove uh, all that OEM business uh, essentially lead to the IFD aftermarket products or, or how, how did that, how did those two le uh, feed into each other? That's right. So we had our small display products originally, the EX500, EX600 that were very popular MFD products, which led to the big screen MFD that went in Cirrus and Lancer and a bunch of others. And that led to the PFD. Those were separate products. Mm -hmm. And over time, that led to the R9 integrated flight deck, which the primary difference was really having the FMS integrated in it. And then that led us back to the smaller form factor products that had a lot of MFD functionality. I mean, the IFD 550 even has some PFD functionality in it. And so that led us back to smaller form factors. And now we're probably heading back to bigger form factors. <laughs> so um, with a lot of technology that we've developed over the years. So it's just kind of things move around on you. Is that a, is that a hint of products to come when you say that? Um, I can't make any, well, but we have a, we have a line <laughs> that I make the sales guys memorize that something like, you know, we have not, no comment on any unannounced products or something like okay. that. Okay. All I know is a little something slipped in there about larger form factors, so I'm not going to let that. Okay, we'll we'll let that go, but it goes without noting. <laughs> yeah. Fascinating. So, uh, the, the to tell me a bit about the IFD evolution, the the process of creating those, because um, obviously I, I I fly with those in the Bonanza. We've got uh, uh, both of those products, um, the uh, uh, 540 and 440 version. Um, the Mustang that's uh, behind me here, go that way, that we're building, uh, because that needs to be IFR, it needs to be able to get places to, for display, the, the core of that, and in fact, a uh, panel that uh, just got back and has been cut is cut for uh, the IFD. And so um, it, those are, are such core products feeding into whatever displays anyone chooses to use that um, help me understand that whole process of creating those and then where those are really going. And also, of course, it go, uh, um, they're also even a branded Bendix King as well. Right, so the, you know, the, the, the IFDs really consist, the 540, for example, consists of kind of two major categories of functionality, MFD and FMS navigation. There's, there's, there's nav and com, you know, VHF nav and com, uh, that are a pretty big part of the functionality, but not a pretty big part of the user interface. The user interface, the display, and so forth is primarily MFD and FMS functionality. So 
as we actually started the development of that FMS in the early 2000, probably 2004 or five, something like that. And that sounds like a long time ago, but that is by far the youngest FMS in existence. Yeah. The most by, by a long shot. By a long shot. So the most recently developed. So as we went into it, I mean, you know, and there were Honeywell things and Collins things and Garmin things and Universal things and GE FMSs that were out there. Um, well, what are the core values going to be of our system? And as is usually the answer when Avidine goes to design something, it started with uh, how do we make these what turn out to be unbelievably complicated systems really, really easy for people to use. The IFR navigation system was developed by a bunch of guys with strips of paper and a bunch of pilots with pieces of paper, kind of knitting them together into procedures. And the procedures were something that humans could sort out on approach plates or on IFR diagrams. When you know, when that was turned into something that a computer could execute, it wasn't ever designed for that at all. And so when you, you know, there are a lot of things that pilots take for granted, you know, that you do on an approach or whatever that are, there's a million different ways to do it and you have to code it in a fashion so such that it works. And we have to code it in a fashion so the pilot never even notices all these little subtleties. So as we went into it, we said, how are we gonna make this FMS really, really easy and I think one of the things we were trying to do was, as avionics products got more capable over the course of the couple of decades before we were doing this, they had many more functions, but we found that a lot of pilots didn't use most of those functions. Mm -hmm. So we would say, we got we to gotta have all the functions that, that you need to do IFR navigation but we want our pilots to be able to use, you know, 80% of what we put in the box rather than 30% of what's in the box, which was what was happening as things were getting more and more capable, but also more complicated. So we went into designing the FMS with a core, you know, belief and, you know, we were designing it from scratch. So we weren't hobbled by anything we had ever done in the past. Um, we said, okay, we just, we're going to design this from the, the pilot interaction from the box first. Uh, rather than, you know, how do we make this tech do all these crazy procedures that don't make any sense from a computer perspective, but they do make sense from a, you know, a pilot with a map perspective. Um, and, and and that was probably what, what drove our development process and eventually resulted in the R9 FMS and the IFD FMS. The right. MFD functionality, if you were to look at it, is pretty similar to what we had on the EX500 and the EX600. It's obviously a couple of decades later with all kinds of new features and FISB weather and, and you know, high res and more colors and, you know, vast databases, terrain and everything else. But at the end of the day, it's it's got some, you know, UI similarities to what we designed in that first generation as well. It seems like there's, from, from my perspective, there's really two sides of that usage. You know, one side of it is the idea of the FMS, the the how do you navigate, how do you control this this to navigate, and um, there's if if you look at either how how jet FMSs and Collins and all these older FMSs were done, uh, and even some of the attempts in uh, folks that may remember the the CNX80, like the first WASP boxes that that came out. It was almost like the using an HP calculator approach versus a, a, another, you know, calculator approach. Like you had to know as a pilot, for anyone out there who's ever flown one of these, they're probably nodding for anyone else. It was like you had to know that you put the numbers in first and then you say what you're going to do with these numbers versus this other logic of, you know, A to B to C. And an FMS, a traditional kind of FMS navigator, I remember when I first got involved in the, in, in the avionics on the manufacturer's side, it's like, what isn't there? Direct two. Direct two isn't there. You know, things like that, that us as GA pilots think are the most simple things in the world are not part of that. So one half of it that, that you've done at Avidon is the side of how does the FMS work? And then the other side is the human factors, buttons, touch, et cetera. So um, tell me about the, the both of those kind of halves of the equation as to how you 
because you really rethought both of those with your your um, avionics. So you're the first person that I've ever known that connected reverse pulse notation with the scratch pad concept of uh, airliner FMSs. So I, I'm going to keep that in mind now. That's that's a actually a pretty good uh, analogy. Um, well, for us, we had the benefit of we had a couple of really experienced FMS designers on our team that had done this before, and so as we said we would like to design it to work like this they 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 could take that and what they know because i think what what probably happened and i really don't know this from a historical basis but i think the first guys to code fms's mm -hmm. it was probably so difficult just to get a computer to do these procedures right that you didn't worry too much about how to get the pilot to tell the computer to do it that just kind of fell out of trying to design something that could possibly do this stuff. We, when we designed the FMS, we designed it in PowerPoint first. So, you know, we we were not constrained by the art of the possible. Mm -hmm. you know, we said, here's a picture and, you know, you here's a button, you push the button and here's how the picture changes and so forth and so on. And our team took that and, you know, in, reinterpreted that into the front end of the FMS and at the end of the day you know what does an FMS do it's it's really maybe three pieces inside of an FMS right there's a database that you go in to get all these procedures there's a user interface where you tell the thing what to do and there's a uh, navigation guidance computer that takes the instructions in the database and spits out courses and deviations and things like that so our system is actually architected with those things reasonably separately Mm -hmm. uh, with the UI on top. And so we designed the UI relatively unconstrained by what it was going to take to implement. And I think that that was, I think we had more compute horsepower than the early ones did. We had more memory. We had more graphics. We had some more interesting uh, mechanical user interface, you know, dual concentric knobs with a push. Um, and we had people who had been through the whole core design stuff and knew how to do it kind of more elegantly. And that that was that was what, how our whole design process unfolded. Did you do a lot with uh, bringing pilots in and testing just how they naturally would try to do to do things if they weren't constrained by the user manual or any any kind of training on how to do it? We did quite a bit of that, and we did it in two forms. We had a pretty well from an avionics perspective, we had a pretty realistic simulator. It wasn't particularly realistic in terms of flying, but you could get in it and sort of fly and have a very realistic avionics experience. And then we had flight test airplanes. And we tried to get pilots from different uh, backgrounds to try both the simulator and the uh, and do do test flights with them to see how they to see how they reacted. And it was we took a huge amount of data when we did this and we found uh that there were certain things that people always wanted to do the same way that 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 makes for an easy decision right everybody wants to do it this way if you implemented it some other way that's wrong here's right get over it fix it and and you do it like that uh we found there were certain other things where it was like left-handed and right-handed mm -hmm. Some people did it a certain way, and the other people did it another certain way, and that was that. And in those cases, we had to decide whether we made something a user selectable option, or did we just pick one, or how do we deal with it? Mm -hmm. And then we found there were some things, and this was especially true as touchscreen came into the into the um, picture, where what we found was that if there was and you would find this on an ifd if you ever looked if you went with three people and you did the exact same flight and you just kind of kept track of how somebody did it in the ifd what we found is that for whatever reason people develop different habit patterns and they just are more comfortable doing certain things in different ways with knobs with buttons with touch what combination is it and in those cases we decided in a lot of cases, and you see this in the IFD, we said, we want to implement this in a way such that you can do some functions two or three different ways, 
all equally well and it's not modal you can just do whatever however you want it at any time hmm. and so that's what we did and so you know one of the things on the IFDs for example we wanted we tried to make it so virtually every function you could do an entire flight plan the whole works without ever touching a button or a knob and we yeah. definitely made it so you could do the whole works without ever touching the touchscreen so you know but but that's that's not what you find you don't find there's pilots that never use the touchscreen or never use the buttons or knobs what you find right. is that pilots use different combinations for different things and so i think that's one of the reasons why people get really comfortable with those products pretty fast mm -hmm. the first time they try and do something the way they want to do it and the product responds and does it and does it for them they're like oh i'm comfortable yeah. you know i've got my way i'll never even know that there's another way to enter an approach right never even know it but what do i care i've got one that i'm comfortable with you know, or another way to, to, to select a frequency or whatever. I got yeah. a couple that I'm comfortable with. I'm done. I'm happy. So that's that's really been having pilot, uh, you know, kind of pilot feedback has been in the you know, early dev development of the product. But even now, you know, what we do is, uh, you know, a Facebook group. We have Abby Live, which is our own online forum, things like that. We have a really active bunch of pilots and they serve up tons of suggestions and um, they end up in the product. Yeah. So, you know, it's it, it's no. interesting because it it's too bad that uh, on one hand you need the regulations to control something so critical to safety of flight as your navigation system. On the other hand, if it, it, it's too bad that it isn't a little more flexible to make it easier for companies like you to roll things out because it's what you're describing sounds like it's so well suited for constant A/B testing of like almost machine learning of okay well if everybody's starting to use it this way we're gonna you're gonna keep evolving and keep evolving and I know you've had a lot of new releases but I'm sure the FAA doesn't make it that easy well I think that uh, you know we we do all our certifications through the Boston uh, aircraft certification office of the FAA and a lot of times they'll have a bunch of national people involved but we have a really good relationship with the FAA so you know once we've certified something and then we're doing the tenth rev of it you know they're 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 going through the process but the FAA gets pretty familiar with these things just like everybody else so uh, that's that's useful um, I I think that uh, you know there are there are, there are groups that work on certification process improvement and um, I think one of the things that I like to say that maybe isn't so popular with my industry peers is that I think the industry is is just as much a part of the thicket of regulations as the FAA, and maybe even more. Um, we have all these big industry groups that get together to write all these things, and you know, when you're in a large group of people working on a on a specification, it tends to be a giant AND gate. Mm -hmm. Somebody makes a suggestion, nobody's right. It's just it's human, uh, you know, being polite. Okay, let's put that in. And somebody else makes a suggestion. Let's just be polite. We'll put that in. And another guy makes a suggestion. It's a decent suggestion. Let's be polite. We'll put it in. Well, at the end of the day, you end up with a lot of stuff. Yeah. So. Yeah. And it, and and ultimately, that's something everyone has to deal with. Now, you mentioned touch screen. So, th what was that like to get through the system and to to be one of the first or the first company to be doing that? as a navigation because ultimately there's a big decision there we went from no touch screen um Avidine made that key decision that you were going to have a hybrid that people could do either buttons and and even even very uh flexible buttons like the rocker buttons at, at the bottom or touch and um you know other companies garmin went with almost sole touch um what, what went into that decision and how hard was it to get through that process right so we were the first to certify a multi-touch device. There were some single touch devices that were kind of hitting the market. And uh, you don't have to stand at a trade show too long and watch, watch somebody walk up to your 2000 era MFD and try and do a pinch zoom on it and it doesn't do anything <laughs> before you figure out that that's what people want to do. Um, so you might as well give it to them. Uh, so it wasn't really that hard of a decision from our perspective being very user interface focused 
to when everybody wanted to do something a certain way and panning and zooming was absolutely that thing that we decided we're going to find a way to give it to them. Um, so that part of the decision making process was pretty easy. Now the technical implementation wasn't so easy, but you know, we had a pretty clear picture. Um, one of the things you get when you do uh, the hybrid touch that we have is you can add a lot more richness to your to your touchscreen because um, if somebody gets into trouble, they got an alternative. By trouble, I mean let's suppose it gets really rough and you just cannot get your finger on the right place of that touchscreen. So during development, if you were to see one of our units during development of a touch function, there's all these red boxes all over the screen. The red boxes are the touch hot zones. If I'm designing a product that's solely touch, I have to make those pretty big so somebody can be guaranteed to hit it under all circumstances. Whereas yeah. if I give them an alternative means of doing it, then maybe they can be smaller and you can have more different kinds of things going on in touch. So that's one of the design, that's what, it's kind of a more subtle design advantage that comes out of having the, the uh, hybrid touch user interface, which is that we can we can actually have a lot more flexibility in what we do with the touch screen than we would otherwise. Uh, that's, that's interesting. I never really thought about that before, but it makes an awful lot of sense because when you're doing stuff with Avanize, uh, M, uh, FMS stuff, like let's say you want to go and put vertical navigation or put a hold in or, or anything, those are pretty small areas if you want to touch them, uh, touch yeah. those blocks and put them in. But I guess you're able to make that you're saying you're able to make them smaller there and have more capability because you don't have to do it that way. You can use a knob. Right. That's right. And so you will find, and I think this is probably generically true, but certainly, um, you know, if you compare ours and other ones that don't have as much mechanical interface like we do, you'll find that if you if you were to map out what the what are the touch zones look like, mm -hmm. we have a lot more, and that lets you do lots of little things, but if one of those little things becomes impossible to do because of uh, turbulence or another reason, a glove, you got a way, you got another way to do it. That's, that's really almost just as easy. Got it. So that, 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 again, these kinds of things you discover early on and then you say, okay, we're going to design the system around that. And you know, how, you know, we have some things that we have bigger touch zones for and some that are smaller because the bigger ones are the ones everybody's going to want to do all the time. And the smaller ones are ones that maybe they won't, or most people will do it with buttons and knobs or whatever. But we can, we can, as product designers, we can make those trade-offs as we go, rather than being limited to large uh, touch zones. Got it. Now, uh, what made you make the next leap, which was into synthetic vision in a navigation unit as opposed to a primary display? I think that was driven by uh, a realization, a, a couple of different things. One of them was, for so many of these airplanes, they just weren't going to get synthetic vision any other way. And it does have some pretty nice capabilities in terms of visualizing where the terrain is on an approach and, and things like you know, 3D traffic and obstacles are pretty good, useful things to have. And people, this was a way to get it to them. Another one was that, and you know, the Cirrus is a pretty good example of this. Some instruments, the location of the standbys and the functionality of the standbys is is makes it really difficult to actually use them when you lose whatever your primary is. Yeah. And while we haven't so low or something we haven't, like that. we haven't certified our stuff to make it so you can use it in place of a, of a standby. It is all certified, you know, a it's a certified Adhars and certified PFD. It's not in the primary field of view. It doesn't have a battery backup necessarily, but you know, it's there and it's absolutely certified for those functions. Um, another, another interesting thing to think about is, and this is true on a lot of light airplanes, you know, if you have kind of the concept of an essential bus or a battery bus, I mean, you can turn almost everything in an airplane off if you've got a 550 <laughs> and fly an approach. Yeah. I mean, At, to know, landing. <laughs> you, you can, I mean, it's, it's got everything. So, you know, if you're trying to conserve battery power, um, you know, you can cut down to that transponder maybe and, you know, be, be pretty capable. Um, yeah. So there's things like that. You get some economy of size and, you know, you get another function in the box and so forth. When we did the 550, it was very interesting because some of the people that we told about it said, there's no requirement for that. <laughs> people aren't asking for that. 
There's no competitor that has that, that you're trying to compete with. Nobody's going to want it. <laughs> that was not how it played out at all. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's very popular and getting more popular. <laughs> oh, I can imagine not, definitely. And I, I have to say I'm looking forward to seeing some of that stuff when we, like I said, I mean, when I think of all the different functions that are in there, we haven't even talked about something like video, for example. I mean, we uh, I was just talking uh, uh, with, with Tom about what can we do for, you know, putting video in the Mustang back here because with that high pitch angle, we could flip one switch yeah. and use that for taxiing without S-turns. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, and that's uh, uh, Tom Harper, your uh, director of marketing. It's yeah. amazing what, what, what could be done on that display in all sorts of circumstances. Uh, so that that is pretty cool. Um, yeah, let's switch gears for a minute. Time. You uh, you work on uh, so many different areas, whether it be working with EAA, Gamma. Um, what, we started this show obviously with uh, the crisis. So much happening in the industry. What's what's happening in in your world at Avidyne, and what are you seeing with your work at Gamma and with EAA? So the impact to Avidyne of the COVID thing has been really remarkable. We got off one big trade show this year, which was the Heli Expo in I think January or February out in LA. We would typically maybe do 50 events over the course of a year. And they've virtually all been canceled at this point. So um, we reinvented how we go to market. And Tom Harper, who you mentioned in our sales and marketing team, very, our sales team loves to travel. They love to be face to face with people. That all went away. The marketing team loves to put on, you know, trade events and we do all kinds of fun things at them. You know, we had our blow up pub at Oshkosh last year. I mean, we have a good time with these events. Awesome. We, to go. we see all our friends, all gone. So we really had to re reinvent our marketing and sales approach. And since we had already been doing quite a bit with internet marketing and database marketing, uh, uh, customer resource uh, relationship management stuff. Uh, we were we were pretty primed up to do it and we, we fired that stuff up quickly and it's been, it's worked out really, really well. Now, from the perspective of being a director of EAA, this is, uh, this is a very, you know, sort of a black swan event. For EAA, you know, 68 years in a row of having the event and the worst, I mean, we used to consider it to be an absolute disaster when we had two days of rain before the show. Now we're going to say, oh, that's nothing. You know, right. uh, you remember 2020 when we had to cancel the whole thing. So, you know, um, uh, certainly EAA had a, I guess, it's a difficult decision to cancel your main event and your big economic driver. On the other hand, there, there wasn't another real option. You know, that that event takes three months to set up. We were we had to make it, or the EA had to make a decision uh, early on, or relatively early, a few, a few months, three months in advance. And at that time, there was just no way to be able to say we know how we can do this. So it was a tough decision, but it was also a non-decision. And that's what's happened with with really all the other events. Um, it's it's been obviously very tough on EAA, but they, you know I mean their their team is you know making lemonade out of the lemons. There's tons of site improvements going on right now and so forth. Right. Fortunately, the organization under Jack has been you know really well managed, and the financial reserves are strong, and the staff is strong and so forth. So, you know, I'm not going to tell you this is a good thing, but on the other hand, EAA is going to come out of it just as strong as ever. Yeah, um, Gamma. You know, where all of the manufacturers get together and, and work together, this has really been very tough on us because I'm used to seeing my peers in the industry, you know, quite a few times a year, several of them being Gamma meetings. And, you know, we have our official business, but we have a lot of side conversations about lots of different things and, and a lot of the industry interaction. This is a, a, you know, very competitive industry, but it's also collegial. Uh, a lot of the collegial stuff goes on at uh, Gamma events. And, there, there aren't any. So, I mean, yeah, we can do these webinar things, but it's not the same as, as you know, standing in the aisles uh, in a break between a meeting, talking to somebody from another, another company, especially the kind of stuff. You know, if there's other avionics manufacturers where Avidine's working with them, we we continue to talk. But, but the other conversations that happen between companies that don't necessarily 
have specific business that they have to specifically talk about. That's all all vanished now, and that I think right. that's that's a really significant negative, and we're all really looking forward to getting getting back into it. But the the, the reality is that's still going to be a while. I've been hearing basically that, echoing that same sentiment uh, throughout my uh, contacts within general aviation through the companies and through the people as well. And it seems like y you have the, the consumer side to, to everyone there, uh, the education level of being able to, to learn things online has filled in a lot of the gaps. It hasn't completely taken over everything or helped fill the gaps for being able to see things in person uh, and really right in your face what this instrument that maybe you're going to spend thousands of dollars on is going to look like, but pretty close and really helped uh, education. So on that end, it seems like a lot of companies are seeing a lot of good connection. But like you've mentioned, the what, what I think a lot of people are not seeing is that the industry itself is really suffering because their own communication is so stymied. And it's not even just the, the gamma side. It could be just that uh, so there's so much work that happens between companies there's, uh, and on all aspects of this ecosystem that is general aviation and it's very very hard to to do that because that's that's such a face to face thing to, and and so many of the people as you mentioned we're a small community people most of the people i know have worked at many different companies within it um, and uh, and and even that that's that's hard to happen during this but it's good to hear what you've said that, um, I mean, there, that uh, EAA uh, is going to emerge through this uh, as stronger, stronger than ever before, having been through it. You know, one of the interesting things, obviously, we do this uh, webinar uh, stuff and we're, we're trying to use those as a means to communicate with our customers and prospective customers. And they frequently have Q&A sessions on them so that people can ask questions and so forth. But I'll tell you from the perspective of um, us as a manufacturer and as somebody who attends a lot of these events and talks to a lot of, of people, the feedback part feels much less. I hope we're doing a decent job of, of telling people about our new products and features and things like that. But in terms of the feedback that we get, you know, there's nothing like standing at a trade show booth or, you know, uh, some kind of an event and having somebody pull you aside and say something completely that your your initial reaction is, that's completely crazy. Mm. You say, well, you know, maybe it isn't so crazy. You know, that, that kind yeah. of feedback that you get from side conversations and so forth at, at all kinds of events, uh, you know, we all miss that. And certainly I have to tell you, our... our sales and marketing and customer support teams, they really, I mean, the people who go into that line of work really like interpersonal type stuff. And uh, yeah. so they're, they're very much looking forward to getting back to something resembling normal. You got, a, you got a lot of extroverts that are bottled up in cubes right now or sitting at home on headsets yeah. and uh, having a very hard time not being able to be there in front of people. That's true. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that I, I have spent quite a bit of time traveling to different avionics shops and other businesses in general aviation um, uh, throughout the crisis. And one of the things that has been really good to see is that uh, um, it seems that people are not stopping their investment in the aircraft, which is supporting the industry, because the avionics shops are, are still booked and they're still rolling. They haven't slowed down. And um, I, I've said it many times in other broadcasts, we're built for this, and it's nice that if you were to go back six months, a year ago to any of these facilities, they already had people working 20, 30 feet apart, wearing gloves and <laughs> underneath their own aircraft. And these are the folks that install all of our products. Um, and, and so they're still hopefully healthy and moving along, and anything we can do to keep supporting that's a good thing. That's right. We have been... You know, business slowed down at the end of April when really everywhere had a some form of uh, you know restrictions and but it recovered really quickly in May and like you say one of the things we found is a lot of our installation shops they might have worked through a little bit of their backlog but they're still quite busy and our business is still pretty good and, and go growing quickly I will say though that that has been less true 
outside the United States. Mm. Now, South America is at an absolute standstill. Mm. Uh, and Europe for a while, essentially, you couldn't, you just couldn't fly your GA airplane. Wow. Um, you know, essentially, all the GA was grounded. So uh, I think that, uh, that worldwide, things are, are a little bit behind in terms of, of recovering and reopening. And, and I, I, but I fully expect there to be a huge amount of pent up energy when that happens. Yeah, can you, I can only, it does put a smile on my face and a glimmer of hope. I can only imagine how booming next summer is going to be with all of this behind us. It'll be a whole new, that, that will be the most epic air venture Oshkosh to ever go to. Um, the, the, the event attendance I think is going to be off the charts when it starts happening again. I know yeah, that, so, you know, the first time I could actually get out and go travel to a partner company or, or anywhere, I was like, I'm going, you know, it's like, I'm going. <laughs> Usually I really, you know, I'd ra probably rather stay home than travel, but uh, you know, after not doing it for a few months, it's like, okay, I need to get out there. I feel like I'm, you know, not, there's something missing here. So how about your personal flying now? You, you mentioned you just got a tailwheel endorsement not that long ago. Yeah, I got that, I think in January and I'll, I'll probably get a, a cub. My hope is to do a, uh, one of these high school build a plane programs um, and build a, uh, one of the glass areas that, you know, that, uh, the Gamma and, and others have done as, as these projects. Um, and, um, but practically speaking with my four hours of tailwheel experience, I need to get a cub and get good at it. So that's, that's probably the, the first thing. And I do, you know, I kind of, I, a lot of the flying, if I'm just, if I just like go get an airplane and fly, I'm just doing it for the fun of it, go sightseeing, whatever. A lot of the flying I do is, is still, um, you know, engineering flight test stuff. So, you know, we're, we're constantly adding new features to our products and we're putting them in experimental airplanes and we're flying around with them and we're breaking them and going back to the uh, engineering team and saying, how about doing it a little bit differently because that that's how it seems to work so i, I do i do a fair amount of that the 206 is uh is kind of like if i had to just go fly somewhere i would take that um and uh i've had that for that's funny i kind of went full circle i had you know learned to fly in cessnas then i had moonies and then we had a lot of cirrus i got a, a bunch of time in the cirrus we did a lot of work in cirrus i still think cirrus is a great airplanes but i kind of wanted a station wagon and, or I guess nowadays you'd call it a, uh, I don't know, a, a crossover SUV. or something. A crossover, yeah, an SUV. SUV. Whatever. And um, the 206 will do that. You can load it with everything under the sun. It, it doesn't care. It'll go in and out of anything. And uh, it's, it's super easy and fun to fly. And, you know, so I've, that's, that's the airplane that I'm, that I'm, you know, kind of enjoying right now. Um, I still have a Lake Amphibian. Oh, um, you still have that. I still have that. It hasn't been getting a lot of use, but I'm hoping that, you know, we're getting back into a mode where I can uh, dust that off. I've got quite a bit of time and it had a lot of great adventures in that airplane. We did have it. We did turn into an avionics uh, when a test fleet when we needed a bunch of airplanes. We we had we were up to like, you know, th three or four in the thick of the IFD development. We had a lot of different configurations of equipment we needed to have installed in airplanes. We kind of dragged that thing into experimental service. And turn it into a test bed. A Lake uh, Amphibian avionics test bed. That's yeah, a we did that. A new... And um, and uh, you know we had two Cessnas in a, in a Cirrus and a Lake as as test beds um, when we needed a lot of airplanes with a lot of different configurations in them. That went on for a few years, but then recently we've kind of brought both our Cirrus and the Lake back into uh, normal category, and they're all cleaned up and you know. Um, that they look civilized as compared to our <laughs> our two hardcore flight test airplanes are 182s and they uh they have they some of the contraptions we put in those things people would just not believe but uh that's what they're <laughs> oh that's it well it sounds like a lot of fun I, i'd love to see the lake sometime that is uh that's such a fun airplane although i don't know whether it's true or not that it won't hit vne in the dive but uh <laughs> it will fly straight down pretty comfortably <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it's one of those things that uh, you you uh, if somebody told you that you could just tip it over and point it straight down and sit there and wait nothing would really happen 
you wouldn't really believe it. And then if somebody demonstrated it to you in the airplane, you'd still probably not believe it. But then when you did it, you'd say, it'll really do that. <laughs> <It'll>, <laughs> That's amazing. So uh, those are massive drag mobiles. And uh, uh, they're, they're kind of bad airplanes, bad boats, and bad on the ground, but they'll do all three. So, but they're know, but, so that's so beautiful. I love it. I, I think it's a great plane. Yeah. So what's the latest at Avidine? Tell us what's happening now and, uh, and, and what you can let sneak out, if anything, about where, what's happening next. So the biggest thing that we're working on right now are our, our introduction of our Atlas and Helios products aimed at business aviation and uh, the larger helicopter market. And those are based on our core technology that's in the IFDs. And we announced them uh, this year, and uh, or the, the Atlas last year and the Helios this year. And they're in the end of their, they're in the kind of last part of their certification process. So, um, you know, one of the interesting things is that obviously, our, as we talked about, our products are combination FMS and MFD. A lot of that MFD functionality it's not that easy to get into some of these business aviation airplanes. You've got these old EFSs or maybe mechanical that doesn't do any of that stuff. You got an FMS that does FMS stuff, probably doesn't have WAS. So you put one of ours and you get WAS and LPVs and ADSP stuff, which is great, but you also get all this MFD functionality. So um, we've had a really good response to that, and, and I think people are excited about it. We have a really big new release of software that we're, um, that'll be the end of the year time frame that'll add in a, a bunch of, of neat new things that people have been asking for, big things and little things and so forth. Uh, and then we have, you know, some 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 new products and, and new new partnerships that we're working on. One of one of the things that has been really quite interesting is uh, you know in the 2000 decade there were a lot of new aircraft manufacturers. In the 2020 decade there are a lot of new something that's flying machines of some sort manufacturers, <laughs> call them EV tolls or ODMs or UAMs or whatever you want to call them, uh, UASs, UAVs, there's all these flying things, a lot of them electric powered, a lot of them with autonomy capability or desired AI stuff and uh, really different sort of mission profiles. And we're working with a number of those different companies, and it's really, really interesting. It's kind of, it's neat to be in our position where we can go and and talk to a whole you know, on a non-competitive basis. We can go talk to a bunch of these guys, and they'll they'll tell us about their whole approach to things. And you know, we're not, again, we're not really in the business of trying to guess who's who's, uh, you know, which uh, market model or aerodynamic picture is is going to be the winner. That's not our expertise, but um, it's really, really neat to be involved in the industry right now on that front. And you've got a division of Avidine essentially, or a co-company or sister company that I think uh, 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 essentially is in that business or, or is, is helping that business? We have a sister company called Autonodyne that we spun out about four years ago to work on, on autonomous, uh, you know, autonomous vehicles using our our, our functions. Yep. That's turned, and you know, they have a website, you can go see what they do. That's turned out to be principally for government and military type applications. Mm. We're one of not a lot of companies focused on doing control systems for not only small UAVs, but big UAVs. Um, we've done projects with a couple thousand pound Mach 0.80 UAVs and done control systems for them. So that's pretty cool. At this point, it doesn't cross over that much with what's going on in GA, but at some point, I think in the future, these will start to merge. Well, it's pretty it's pretty impressive to see that that range and see a crossover. And it, it's always fascinated me that the the biggest, most expensive hardware, you know, in aviation is in some ways the last to get some of the best technology. And so that is you're migrating the IFDs up. It's it's it, it's really fascinating. Here's one of the things that we found that was a little surprising as we went into the to the you know big UAV business. Well, yeah, you know, we've put all this effort into making light planes easier to fly for private pilots, right? Well, guess what? Those remote UAV operators 
are in the same position that private pilots were in 20 years ago, which is wow. this stuff is really not very easy to use at all. And they would really like it to be so that they can more easily train the pilots. They, you know, their pilots are flying these airplanes remotely, but they can more easily train the pilots and that the pilots can manage more tasks and maybe at some point can manage multiple airplanes and so forth. So a really interesting cross crossover of Avidine's, you know, kind of core, you know, skill set of making things easy for pilots turns out to be really valuable for making things really easy for remote pilots too. I never that's would have thought of that, but that's what we found out. That's fascinating. Well, Dan, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, it, all of this is is just just fascinating. Um, I appreciate your time and everything that you do, both with Avidyne and also for general aviation through through Gamma, through EAA, uh, through your philanthropy and all the other work uh, that you do. So uh, thank you so much for joining us here in Social Flight Live. Thanks, Jeff. It's really been a pleasure being with you tonight and, um, you know, continue to do all the great things you're doing with Social Flight. I know I read that thing every, what is it, Thursday and say, which ones of these things can I find a way to go to? So. <laughs> You're doing us all a, a great service, not just, I mean, I suppose on the marketing side, but also just in terms of giving us a, a more easy way to go out and find something fun to do in our airplanes. Well, I really, really appreciate that. Our goal is to support general aviation anytime that uh, we're accomplishing that goal. I am very, very happy. So again, uh, Dan Schwinn, founder and CEO of Avidine, thank you so much for joining us. And to everyone who's joined us this evening and for our entire series, we will be back next Tuesday at 8 p.m. as we are at every Tuesday. Uh, we have next Ryan Reed and Ryan Braun of U Avionics will be joining us next week. We'll take one week off for a break during what was the Air Venture Week to do an adventure, a flying adventure out there. And then Mike Bush, is back on July 28th to talk about uh, aircraft and engine diagnostics. Until next time, thank you so much, Blue Skies.